So thank you for the invitation, and I'm going to uh, speak in English with a bit of Hebrew when I'm not sure about what I'm saying, um, or if there's any questions. Um, um, I've been working in uh, the UK for the last 25 uh, years, more or less, uh, studying. Um, but when this opportunity came up, I think uh, every time you give a talk, it's an opportunity to think about what's going on and moving your thinking along. And so I'm, uh, I'm thanking you for this opportunity also on the sense of kind of thinking about uh, our practice. And I think one of the things that MAs are for are for prototyping what is happening in our discipline. So every time an MA is thinking about what it's about, what's its relationship to work and practice, and how it's teaching, it's kind of the best environment to prototype our profession because it's connected to industry, but it's in an academic or in, in a kind of experimental mode. And there is a, a group of people that are um, both teaching and learning uh, in an environment where they've already decided they are designers or they are part of a profession. And therefore, many of the iterations and evolutions of design as a practice have come from MAs. Uh, thinking about um, how the profession uh, reacts to the world. And so I've kind of taken this opportunity to think about that. Uh, but uh, the talk that has been kind of focus is will focus on social design because that's where I'm involved now and, and that's where I think we can do a big uh, push. But it's also really a talk about uh, purpose. And so I want to change the name of the talk to say that uh, I think we need to spend time thinking about our purpose. And that's as individuals, as learning institutions, as professionals, um, and gear our methodology to our purpose. And I think we are going to hear uh, enlightening talks about how things uh, can work better. Um, but I'd really like to kind of leave that word as a... Um, backbone to the whole talk is about purpose. Uh, I've been involved in teaching for about 25 years. I'm uh, very uh, interested in formats of teaching. So I'm one of those teachers that tries not to teach the same lesson twice. And I know that there is big value in teachers who improve a lesson and make it better. And I think we need these two um, types. But um, I've been involved in graduate, postgraduate research. But in the last few years, I've kind of taken myself out of that and started looking at schools um, and how design is uh, learnt rather than taught in school environments. Um, I've also used curating. Um, and I think since about 2002, I stopped kind of uh, making things or products. And I moved much more to process uh, and uh, to people. And I used curating as a way of thinking. So curatorial thinking has been something that I've been also teaching with. And uh, the future is here, which is very reassuring. Um, right now, I, um, I, I run a, a small creative cultural consultancy. We uh, work with uh, commercial and educational and, uh, edu uh, and cultural institutes. Uh, we come up with feasibility, vision, and try and help people do projects that help them define their next steps. So we're involved in change, in learning about change. We love to engage with data, and we love to come up with ideas in response to data. So we have a very strong relationship with data. Curatorial practice is something that we do when an exhibition is the right response. It's not like our automatic. That's not our sector, but we are, as a designer, ending up doing curating. I'm not a curator, and I don't have the historical grounding, and I'm not a keeper, so I don't have the object uh, knowledge in that sense. But I am interested in the role of uh, these stories in shaping our lives and how design is part of that. So that's the curatorial and design education. We're involved now in uh, about 35 universities across the world through uh, uh, some of our programs. Um, so this is the structure of the uh, talk. Um, acknowledging, as Sigal uh, explained to me, that the, the, uh, 
this MA and, and, and this is the time that you are thinking about how to respond to a changing world. I'm not going to go into which changes and which shifts are happening because I think this is an audience that is aware of uh, the changing worlds and the fact that um, design has always responded to changes. But it's also, um, I guess, and I'm, I'm, I want to quote um, a research paper by Morelli from 2007. Design has mostly been complementary to business strategies and market-driven approach. And this is something that our profession has been connected to very strongly. Um, but 40 years ago, there was a, a writer called Papanek who also talked about our responsibility, and Victor Margolin, who took it a step forward. And I'd like to have them in the background as kind of saying, this is not new what I'm talking about, but we might have been really uh, involved as a design, prof as professionals, very much in the market-driven, uh, desire-driven economy, and maybe it's time to have a look. Um, so then I'll talk about the new narratives that we are trying to create and new practices. Um, but really change comes whether we do something about it or not. And this is uh, Ursula Le Guin, the writer. And I like this quote because I'd like to start every talk with it more or less because uh, we, have, we don't have to respond to things and maybe people don't, but designers have that ability to um, help process and help uh, uh, respond to change. We're all negotiating change in our personal lives, in our professional lives. But as designers, we have tools and we can be part of things and part of groups. And I think that's the other big shift is that design has grown up to understand that it's not about itself and it can be and should be part integral to a bigger, wider uh, work with uh, other disciplines, and we're going to hear later about how that happens. Um, but uh, in terms of what's driving change, we all know there are big shifts, uh, demographics, climate, cities. Um, I'm going to relate to our ability to respond to the uh, changes in uh, social need. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves, so what does this change look like? How do we uh, recognize it? And what do we look for when we've done a project? What do we look for to see if we've impacted and created something that is uh, part of the change that we would like to see? Um, and I think there are three, three terms that help us um, negotiate this, ch this change. And these are three terms that we as professional designers or uh, people that are using design and understanding how to use the tools that are coming out of design should think about very deeply. And this is openness, engagement, and responsiveness. And I think, above all, if I have to choose one, it's engagement. Um, so we have to respond and engage with change. And for that, I kind of took a minute to kind of think about what's really driven our uh, discipline. Um, so I took this, uh, the reason I kind of also personally, I went to study uh, in the Royal College of Art after doing a degree in Bezalel and working uh, uh, for three years um, at an industrial design studio called Gad Charney. And uh, as a junior, worked a lot in office furniture and the profiles of PVC edgings and learned a lot about the relationship with engineers and the relationship of presentation to, uh, and work. Uh, but then I went to, to kind of discover who sets the briefs. I was interested, I discovered more in why are we doing the things, not how. Um, and so I looked to the UK because in 1851, the UK had this uh, moment in time where it opened up from inside to the international scene. Um, and then 100 years later, post-war, Industrial design was defined as a profession, really, in relation to research. Research became part of industrial design. Um, a few years later, when industry was harder to engage with, uh, the UK designers uh, discovered they have to talk out again, and communication, and critical design came in. Um, while that's the period that I started studying uh, design in the 80s. And we were told technology is 
way ahead of us. Design is about saying what it's for and giving that beginning that it's all about technology, harnessing um, uh, technology towards uh, the user's uh, engagement. Ten years later, and I think we can try very, very clumsily to look in blocks of ten years. Ten years later, we saw a real shift with kind of uh, user-centered design coming into its own. So technology wasn't the big thing. It was about, it did move into user-centered design. And I think a lot of us got involved in those methodologies that started coming out. User-centered design. Then ecological concerns came in very strongly. Um, and we're kind of reaching a, a ecological, environmental, and from there, about five, I'd say, five years ago, we started looking at the whole kind of combination of these things, and uh, service design came into play, um, and we were looking at kind of um, the relationship with, in, with management very strongly. Design and management became a very interesting thing. Globalism, global society, uh, experience became much more dramatic than user-centered, but user experience. Um, and social issues came to the fore, almost pushed aside the, uh, the ecological or combined. So socio-ecological and the maker movement kicked in to some extent, um, responding to these things, globalism, um, activism, uh, independence, all kinds of things are coming in. At the same time, our networks are beginning to be very strong. And we can see that communities are no longer that national. They are commercial networks or uh, social networks, so, and the response to that was this kind of individualism and the network. So the networked individual is a kind of the thing that came after that. Now we're talking about autonomy, and uh, I think uh, autonomous robotic responses to the world, but also our autonomy and um, how does that d relate to big data. And the thing that's looming very strongly now is actually science. And I think that's kind of where we're in the next uh, b block. We're going to be involved a lot with science, or at least that's one of the territories that is very rich. Um, and what's next is left for MAs like this to discover and kind of set uh, the agenda. Um, but what I did is try and take a look at the last 50 years of all the design iterations, disciplines, this diversity that has happened. And you can look, it's not really focused, is it focused? Yeah. It's focused enough. Um, so, you know, commercial art or decorative art or uh, bionic design or all these uh, terms, they evolved out of places like this that we're trying out to define what uh, contribution. Now, one thing to say is that a lot of this diversification is about specialism. And a lot of it is also about finding a market compared to other places. Uh, some of these are about defining a process, and some of these are about defining a purpose. And I think that's where it begins to be important to identify which of these types of design. I don't know. Uh, do you remember bionic design? Anyone remember this term whenever we were told to look at animals? Um, or semantic design? Do you remember semantic design? Who, who used the term semantic design? Yeah? You remember it's uh, got to look like what it means. Or, uh, and then we've had uh, um, interface design come in, interaction, digital design it's been called, UI, UX, IoT design now. All these terms, do they mean something or are they very temporary? And sometimes they, ha they hang on. Um, integra integral or integrated design. Integrated design is a very strong concept that is also uh, not new, but less designers know about it. Uh, because it was kind of counter-cultural uh, to the designer author. It was not the, you know, Philip Starr kind of uh, star system. It was about a very comprehensive, responsible, multidisciplinary approach. And it was not considered the kind of, in the 80s, it wasn't what most design students came across. 
Um, and it's a very uh, timely thing, actually, now when we are beginning to understand that design is a player, it's not a leader, it's one of a team, it's part of something. Um, and so we see things like integral design coming up, for instance, in India, which is integrate the design with a, co with a social agenda. Um, and social design and co-design, which I think are interesting. But I want to uh, pick two of these, the two lower ones, discursive design and uh, reconstrained design. So discursive design is what's come out of the kind of critical design, is when design is being used to raise an issue, often to warn us rather than offer us an option. And that's my kind of, uh, I guess, issues with it is that it's often very much about waving a finger at us saying if we continue this way we will be giving our souls to robots and we, our DNA will be controlled by mice and all that. This is very interesting but what does that, what's the response to that? And that brings on the idea of proposition or propositional design which is where I've been working. Um, most of my uh, interest is in that Okay, this is really interesting. Data is interesting. Speculation is interesting. But what's our response? Um, and uh, recently I've come across in uh, Madeira, there's a research institute that comes out of a computer interface um, research uh, co uh, unit called MITI, Madeira Institute of uh, Technology and Interface. And they've, they're talking about reconstrained design, which is responding to this relationship that designers had with the markets and saying, wait a second, the constraints most of the designers are responding to are market driven. What if we rethink these constraints? What if, which is something in a way that we always do. We get a brief and we consider the constraints and we say, do we take them seriously or do we question them? Or, but as a discipline, reconstrained uh, design also looks at the power structures behind the design. Why is someone setting the brief as it is? Why are they asking us to consume more energy? Why are they giving us so many outlets in our homes so we can be comfortable with our charging of, of uh, objects everywhere instead of designing ways of producing energy by yourself? So they are looking at reconstrained design as a way of questioning the uh, power structures behind it. Expanded design practice, which is one before, is happening in Goldsmith. It's a new MA, which is really looking at the relationship of design with politics, design with lifestyle, design with media, design with uh, culture, and they are running their MA as a kind of almost uh, throwing design into these environments with people from those environments. Uh, it's not the approach that integrated design has taken, which is still kind of becoming more and more professional about a comprehensive um, approach to design being involved from the identity to the packaging, from the environment to the... Um, so it's a different approach, which is much more a kind of cultural agenda of design. But it's an interesting multidisciplinary approach, and we'll see what happens in... Uh, Goldsmith um, and um, in the last uh, last year I spent half a year in a university called KADK in Copenhagen in a uh, research environment called code design they're interested in collaborative design in uh, participatory design and it's very uh, much ab about learning from anthropology and sociology less about the product, very much about the process. So, you know, when you study design, you learn about ethnography and you learn about user research, but that's a, like a really tip of, the, of, this, of these disciplines. And sometimes it's very shallow in a way, and we are selling these, or as designers, we're selling this as part of our ability, but really what we know is one or two methods and we do it on the way. It's not an in-depth, and it would be much healthier to work with a professional in the team that actually has the depth of experience and knowledge rather than do the thing that happened after IDEO that a lot of people reenacted design without actually designing. They're going through the process of design thinking, but there's no freedom of thinking really. And uh, so that brings another subject that uh, we talked about, Sigal was mentioning, is kind of, uh, okay, so we have creative thinking and we have critical thinking. What, what happens when we bring them together? Um, and that should happen in NMA. 
Um, so uh, yeah, but the thing that's um, present in all these different things is design. The, it is design that holds all this exploration together. And today I just want to kind of, I guess, uh, shine the light on social design out of all these. Um, and one way that I uh, help myself and students and research environments negotiate what we're focusing on is are we looking at our practice? Are we looking at the process of the specific project or are we looking at the product? And this has been a very useful tool for us because you can also th ask this question about collaboration. What are you collaborating? Are you collaborating with other practices? Or are you collaborating? Is the process collaborative? Or is the product supposed to be collaborative? You can ask this question about open design. What should be open? Should your practice be open? Should your process or should the product that you're doing be open? So it's a kind of useful tool. Um, but really, um, the question for anyone running an MA is how the purpose of the MA influences the practice that you're teaching. And in that sense, when we are designing, what is the thing we want to be? This is an illustration by a designer called Kobe Barhad, who took my whole lecture and said, I'll do it in one slide. You'll see. Boom. So he sent me this. He is now based in Canada. He's brilliant. He used to be in it from now on and did a lot of our projects. But he said, if you don't have time, just show this. <laughs> um, but really, it's about the relationship of design and being part of something and what we focus on, but also uh, what we want to see change in. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me very strongly uh, about, I guess, seven, ten years ago is that designers uh, and the general public are losing touch with um, making and material intelligence and a lot of the design is happening on screens and away from people. So these two real strong parameters or things that we use to the, the, the maker, the designer maker, the craftsperson um, used to make something for someone. So they would hear from the person what they need. They'd go into the workshop, they'd give it to the person and there were those two sides really became very further apart when industrial designers were uh, specifying molds and materials from a uh, uh, software program, sending them not being present, not in the collection of the data, because that came from marketing, and not in the response to the data. And now, things are changing, because we can have access to uh, people, and we can have access to manufacturing again. Some of the manufacturing can actually happen even locally again, because the digital arena has really shifted things. It's a massive, big change. Um, but in order to raise this issue, um, I chose to uh, respond to an exhibition. I was invited to do an exhibition called Craft Traces. So it's kind of, what, where do we see craft in the world? And instead of that, I asked the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Crafts Council, could we kind of take a step back and look at uh, the knowledge of making? and all the different communities of practice that making is important for. So designers, surgeons, fashion designers, engineers, um, different crafts. Uh, but this idea of communities of practice became uh, something to work with. And the response was power of making, which was a 200 uh, objects and the knowledge of how they're being made. Um, it was a, a kind of Aladdin's cave where you walked in. There, there wasn't like a route, but each group of things explored uh, something that designers and makers think about, like precision or volume or uh, connecting things. Or, but it was also uh, an opportunity to put a makerspace in a museum. And this is the first time a museum has hosted a live makerspace with the exhibits. So there was the history of 3D printers, uh, desktop 3D printers there, but we use them. And we had Adrian Boyer, who made the first RepRap there, explaining his ideology, but also making a RepRap on the same table with people. And we discovered that a lot of people like watching other people make. Um, and you can attest to that, you know, YouTube is an amazing resource, but also uh, it's a useful one. So um, the digital uh, knowledge sharing uh, 
and the physical have to work together. Um, so this makerspace also prompted, pushed me into start, uh, starting uh, being involved in setting up makerspaces from amateur ones or real first access for children, which are not fab labs, because fab labs or hacker spaces are quite hard for people to walk in if they're not part of the, uh, say, uh, black uh, t-shirt, uh, rock and roll, and, uh, and coding, soldering type. Um, so barriers became the big focus, maker spaces and barriers. And that's why I was also involved in a very Pro Makerspace, which is the central research hardware. It, it's an innovation uh, maker to business. The, it's kind of taking existing prototypes and talking to the makers about design for manufacturing, which is much closer to what we were trained as industrial designers, was really actually design for manufacturing. It was never uh, intended originally for um, cultural debate, although that came in, the gallery arena has become a kind of bouncing off place for ideas, but it was designed for manufacturing. And this is being clear about what the makers, the purpose of each makerspace became the thing that we are from now on is good at. We help people define what a makerspace, what's their audience, what should happen there, and then uh, um, from that I moved on to kind of trying to understand why people uh, relate to design sometimes in a problematic way, why industrialists uh, see it as a high risk thing, why people think it's all about lifestyle, and so I had the opportunity to work with a design museum in London. It's recently opened, and um, the, also the big thing was that uh, for the first time, the collection uh, had to be, because of the funding, had to be a free exhibition. And so we took the opportunity to uh, rethink explaining design, not the history of design. And the focus was on the impact of design on our lives. Um, the exhibition, the permanent collection uh, display, which we uh, curated, takes the relationship between designers, makers, or manufacturers, and users. And it's the first museum that as you walk in, this big sign is one of these, uh, you know the signs that have three panels and they rotate? Ta-da. Um, like on big highways, those kind of ones that flip between ads. So we use that and they flip between user, designer, maker, and it's the first big thing. And it's the first museum that has the thought that the user is the thing you see. You come into this amazing building, you see the word user, and uh, it's not, f yes, it is for designers, but it's also for all of us to understand. And it's shifted the design museum from being for specialists to being for general public. And that was the brief we got. Um, so designer maker user is up, it's negotiating the impact of design, so social impact, branding, identity, and making manufacturing. Um, if anyone goes there, um, you'll see that it's really crowded and full of things, but it is about trying to explain the narrative, the new narrative that design is part of shaping our lives. Um, and also, questioning what is a designer now that everyone can design. I don't know if you've seen these amazing new programs where you can generate an identity there are, or you can design stuff. You don't need to be a designer. You know, there, there are programs that allow you to design stuff. You put in your name and your strap line. You've done your marketing. You choose between the types you like. You get your business card. You get your, you know, within 20 minutes, you've done the job that other people pay 15,000 pounds for and take three months. Is it good enough? Well, for a lot of little businesses, it's a lot more than they do anyway. So yes, for proper big commercial entities that want to communicate their values, absolutely not. So the depth of the design process really is about connecting to the values and bringing them out, not the surface. Um, and so this sign is turning. And uh, it deals with the impact of design on our lives. So we have objects like uh, the child. Um, uh, splinter, you know, the, the, um, um, it's made of uh, um, laminate, laminate uh, but in a kind of 3D formed laminate, and we have it next to the AK-47, and we're asking the question of what is good design with these objects, and so it brings in a critical, they both belong to kind of warfare and, and military investment has been one of the big drivers of innovation. And so it's kind of uh, the saying, 
it's not really about this is an important object and this person did it. It's about how do you evaluate what it does in our lives. Um, and in this sense, I was very relieved when the conversation about the value or what we assess about design started opening up. And the term of triple bottom line that came out of kind of ecological, sustainable uh, uh, theory and then management and now practice um, really looks at not just the balance sheet of the uh, money that's been made, not just the economic uh, achievement, but also the sustainable achievement and the social. And this is, I think, something we need to learn about a lot more is uh, how do we understand uh, to evaluate uh, the social, you know, uh, social return on investment? What are the things that we can talk about? You know, the, and, and there is quite a lot of material online. I, I just want to mention one paper which is really great at uh, just helping think about the, the social return on investment. And it's uh, this uh, Indiana Business Review. Um, and it's talking about uh, the theory that a guy called John Elkington from a kind of sustainable background has been talking about a lot. Uh, but really, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for the kind of uh, how, did, how do we measure health or education or safety and security? How do we mention we evaluate quality of life or, you know, even really simple things like people's participation in their community, citizenship? So these parameters. Actually, when you look at the arguments, they support economic uh, growth as well. And uh, in that sense, um, I guess uh, Amitya Sen, the, the uh, economist and Nobel Prize winner, has coined uh, a kind of, not coined, but has written about this kind of um, um, social choice, the ability to have. So, so he talked about rights in the sense that they're not rights if you're just supposed to have them. They're only rights if you are able and capable to receive them. And how do we mention or measure these uh, rights? And the, that's kind of the basic thing, you know, removing barriers uh, for, uh, I'm jumping ahead, but uh, removing bar barriers that will improve human well-being. And you know what? Design is amazing at identifying ways of removing barriers and helping people look at a system and what are the barriers that stop them from taking their kid, spending time for a father, spending time with their children, or for people to uh, take care of their diet, or to finding out and designing the interface with the world to en remove barriers. And I think uh, removing barriers to enable choice is kind of, for me, what the new definition for design really. Um, so a few examples, because we're designers, we need visuals. Um, access to education, one laptop per child project, started off really well, then didn't quite work, but really set the scene and, and opened up. Um, improving conditions, the ability to take water. So yes, there is water in the world, but we can't use it because it's in the wrong place and we, it's difficult to move it. And um, so designing uh, the water wheel or uh, recently this uh, um, new type of uh, high street uh, restaurant. So, you know, in the UK, children uh, from um, low income families uh, don't have a lot of, a lot of hot meals. And so schools give hot meals, but a lot of the, of the children go out to the high street and they buy fried chicken from the lowest uh, price. And often that is really bad um, oil, really bad chicken, and it taps into the problem of obesity because the cholesterol levels, and it's, a, it's not a, an anecdotal, it's happening across the world, this uh, relationship with fast food. Uh, this is a group of, design, of cultural uh, entrepreneurs who have worked with designers to create a new uh, chicken shop which uses uh, good materials, good process, which costs more. So how do they overcome that? In the evening, it turns into a restaurant where uh, adults that support it pay 
more so that the children can, in the day, pay the same as they would in the other places. And they have workshops about healthy eating and sourcing and cooking. And so it's really not about chickens. And a lot of them have moved also to uh, other kind of more vegetarian versions of this because these kids don't touch vegetables. So it's an access point to change. And it's about health. It's not about uh, food or any city bike initiative is not about making money from selling bikes, is it? It's about allowing people to uh, open up the city, but also uh, health and access to something they maybe couldn't afford. So city bikes is a really good example. Um, fair, uh, in terms of products, and I guess phones is something we all have in our pockets. And who's come across Fairphone here? OK. So Fairphone is uh, an Android phone, has two SIMs, by the way, which is very useful. But uh, it's about sourcing the materials from the people who actually mine it and paying them. It's about uh, a circuit board that's designed to have access and repair for the users. It's about the phone itself, the camera, everything is open to repair. And it's about an economic model. It is a phone, but really, it's uh, the Wach Institute in, in Holland has pushed this immensely uh, alongside other kind of uh, uh, other freedom of choice instead of sticking to uh, what we are being pushed. And uh, so they chose the phone to kind of demonstrate another economic model. Um, an architect that has looked at uh, low-cost building, and they came up with this amazing project. I'm not going to go into details, but they built half a house. And so instead of people not returning the investment that the banks gave them, they then have a drive to and a dignity to make their own house. So they build the other half of it. So it is kind of about engagement. It's about higher quality, and it's a really intelligent way of uh, design being part of municipal uh, thinking and also on the ground, grassroots. This couldn't have happened without participatory design process because having the community along it was the first condition. Um, you probably all know this amazing light for places without electricity, but it's become a knowledge sharing platform where they are teaching people how to do it, but they're also teaching people how to think like that. So it's kind of, uh, how do you take the more, or a project that happened in South Sudan with uh, 3D printers being teaching people who need prosthetics to make their own and teach each other. And, you know, this is MakerBot. This is big companies that are uh, sharing their knowledge. We're seeing that a lot with IKEA now, Lego, there's something, Airbnb, Twitter, have projects, they are small teams within them, but it's a big change. They're doing social awareness and so they're using their technologies that work. We know Airbnb works, but can it work in a disaster time to help people or after a bomb to help people find where to stay? Yes. So they're using that. And there's a great exhibition now happening in, uh, I saw it yesterday, really good, in the Tel Aviv Museum. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's a three and a half meters. It's a cons uh, constructive responses to disaster. Uh, the curator is Maya Vinitsky, but they've taken close to 30 projects that demonstrate how to use uh, social technology. And the bottom line there is quality of life, or even the chance to have life. Um, this is a project that we've done about uh, sharing knowledge. It's uh, called the Maker Library Network. The client was uh, the British Council. We uh, tapped into places that make, maker spaces or studios, and we gave them three rules. Uh, they have to uh, teach a skill, show someone else's work, and share their books. And in order to do that, they were given uh, a library open source designed by uh, Alan Meron, uh, who's based in, in London. Uh, but he had to overcome this idea that it's his design and uh, put it up on the open as a wiki to download. And people have iterated with it. And we have seen um, it, it's active now in five countries, in Mexico, Turkey, South Africa, uh, Scotland, uh, UK. There have been some temporary ones in Berlin, in, uh, in uh, Woods, and um, in other places where people are taking these principles and the knowledge, which is on a wiki space, and learning to add critical debate into their making arena. So the question of 
who are you making for and why are you making, not just how. Because we have a lot of hows on the, online, but this critical discussion, and that's why the British Council was promoting it, because it's a cultural agenda connecting between people and creating a knowledge sharing network. Uh, this was a three-year project for us as a client, but then now it's kind of uh, belongs to the network, to the community. Uh, one of the nicest projects in it was in Cape Town. Uh, the Makerspace uh, taught, uh, to, uh, did a project for, it's called the, the uh, TEN, the Employable Nation. They took 10 skills, like shoemaking or welding, and taught them to uh, young adults who are unemployable and hanging around and causing trouble in the streets. They, taught, they teach them these 10 skills, but which e with each skill, they also teach a life skill. So, for instance, uh, with uh, welding, they teach reliability. With uh, printing, they teach communication. And so when the, these people end up with this assortment of skills, they can also talk about what they mean. And when they have their first uh, interview or when they start their business, they understand that this making also has meaning and um, it gives them life skills. So it's a format that then traveled through the whole network and has been used as a teaching format. Um, and yes, we need skills and we need innovation, but we need also the people to understand the social and the teamwork and all these aspects. So this, uh, I just added a slide yesterday because I think it's a strong exhibition. It's worth uh, seeing. Um, but one of our responses to uh, looking at social design uh, was to uh, come up with a way of encouraging uh, designers to get involved locally with someone, with a real person, use their skills for in a social context. And a colleague, a friend called James Carrigan and myself were sitting and thinking about, um, aren't designers and makers re really good at improvising really quick solution, having a go? and kind of fixing something. But what if it was something that was kind of like micro-volunteering across the world, where you do two hours or a day uh, every three months, and how do we do this? So it's all about the format. So taking the barrier away. So people respond to this idea really well, but it's about finding the format that allows people to do it. So we started looking at this idea of fix something for someone and share the story. What would make it work? Uh, we discovered that a lot of these projects were to do with aging popularity, aging well, or projects that happened here. And by the way, Holon is, HIT is one of the strongest uh, advocates of the, of the 30 universities, probably the place that generates the most professional responses, uh, because some of the responses are very quick and are about introducing the idea. Here, it's really changing people's lives. And uh, we've had, we, 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 we have, it's a voluntary uh, team of people running it. It's a not-for-profit. We get films sent in from Mexico, from China, from Japan, and uh, Canada, and here. And uh, it's kind of the best thing. I start my morning with a Google search. And if there's a new film, the whole day is kind of charged with this smile and goosebumps. And you know, it's amazing. Um, I highly recommend a fixed film in the morning. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's about exciting people with skills. They solve problems and share it. So uh, we have guidelines. People download them. They're free. Um, I'm going to show this film with sound. Mandy, Garika, and Tim are fixperts. So are Goran, Alicia, Will, Dan, and Sophie. Hello from all our fixperts, an ever-growing worldwide network of clever, generous people who use their imagination and skills to solve immediate, everyday problems for others. Fixperts work with schools, universities, and companies to encourage people to be resourceful. We do this all over the world, in over 19 countries, with over a thousand Fixperts. Being able to solve problems by ourselves empowers us. I cannot believe the amount of work you guys have done. And makes our communities, our schools, our companies, and our world more sustainable and resilient using our imagination and skills for the benefit of others makes everyone feel good and our work is getting noticed.
Laura, Sarah, Nathan, Maverick and Alana collaborated to help their fixed partner Donal write for the first time since an accident paralyzed him at the age of 16. I haven't written in 15 years. Jeez. I, would, I haven't done that. One of my things is that we need to design a better world. And you guys are going to play a big, big part. All our Fixperts work in teams to make prototypes, test and review their work with their fix partner, and smile a lot when it all works out. Dan and Sophie's fix partner Edna wasn't able to bend to put her socks on, so they fixed that. From start to fixed, the journey is filmed by a fix filmmaker. We have over 250 fix films, and they've been watched over 400,000 times. Fixing together in a team provides inspiration and it creates real human understanding. Fixperts get to apply their imagination and skills for a real immediate purpose. How good is that? Taking part in a fixed project develops problem solving skills and Fixperts really push their making skills. And if they can't communicate their work, well, no one would know what great Fixperts they are. Who knew fixing could improve people as well as things? Fixperts is open to everyone, any and all creative individuals or groups from any background that are looking to get involved in the world they live in. The world needs more people who can solve problems, and you can be one too. Just like Yannick, Tom, Sam, Charlotte, Oliver, Jake, Dory. Why we do it is very close to uh, the kind of values that we want to see happening. Um, and um, it's kind of caught on in, uh, it's now I think 31 universities, in more than two thirds of them it's part of the curriculum, so it's being assessed and part of their studies. Um, some of them do it um, in a kind of short three weeks, some of them do it as a term. We try and share the information between these places, it's an open source, open design, uh, creative commons, but people don't have to do that. They, they, we kind of suggest that, but we open that option to, for conversation. Um, but these values of encouraging creative problem solving, developing empathy and building resilience are also the th about in terms of future of employment. Um, so um, in order to do that, we kind of took a step back in the last year and a half We've kind of said, okay, universities is kind of happening, but we really have to get involved earlier. And we started working with teachers and schools, and we're currently um, submitted our first national curriculum, like Prinat uh, Bagrut uh, um, in Fixperts in the UK. So um, it's taking a lot from the maker movement values, but without being a, a maker movement or to, we're really interested in the values but we're also interested in the relationship between imagination and skills. Skills that um, we are told are what employers will be interested which is problem solving, critical thinking and creativity and this is not about design, this is about the general population. I think design has a big role. Um, and um, this is where we look at what it is and why is problem solving so important to us in terms of humanity. Because it, it is an opportunity to bring together these two sides of creative thinking and critical thinking. Um, which problem you choose to address is exactly about your purpose. Um, and I guess we tried a lot of experiments in schools and libraries and maker spaces. We tried clubs, we tried, you know, after school club, and we decided actually the best way to uh, get change is through the mainstream, uh, main education, which is a harder route, um, which means that we have to work with a lot of very frustrated teachers who don't have time to think about doing things differently. And we have to work with headmasters who have no budget for new things. So how do you find, you need a real systematic or system thinking to get things like that going. Um, so this is the first uh, uh, Fixperts framework. Uh, and we've, we've decided not to go through design and art. We've decided to go through science, technology, engineering, and maths. Because in the UK and in many other countries, STEM or STEAM, if you want to call it, is getting a lot more funding and a lot more attention from policy makers and government, uh, way more than uh, design and art. 
Uh, but we think that the process, um, is it coming together? Uh, the process of uh, project-based engagement for, for children with a problem, with a person, making something in response, getting feedback, doing a design process, a user-centered design process uh, in a school is something that uh, a lot of people can uh, benefit from whether they go into the creative industries or not. Um, and so the other aspect is that when you look at the future of jobs, not the future of employment, uh, but the future of what people will need in the job, not why people are interested in employing. And when we think about robotics and autonomous um, manufacturing production, uh, we need to think about, and they are social skills, they are emotional intelligence. And they are collaboration and teaching and learning from others. So we think that Fixperts as a kind of thing that happens in school will help us negotiate. Uh, in uh, uh, Copenhagen and uh, the, the National Library Association there and in the UK are looking at maker spaces in libraries. But there is a real problem because they think, we'll put a fab lab in a library with all the kit, it's, we know it works, but then it's a barrier. People don't go in there, and it's a separate room because the librarians are worried they don't know what to do with it. So we kind of thought about removing that barrier and said, let's not call it maker, because that already puts, a, like a, the name museum, it's a barrier. Let's call it about a kind of make, a creative space, and let's think about the job description of a maker librarian. And we tried that out in a number of places, and. Yes, it's a kind of hybrid of our two projects, of the Maker Library Network and Fixperts. So we ran Fixperts in libraries. And the librarians introduced us to people from the community who came and worked with the design students. So for the university, it was a community engagement. For the library, it was a way of uh, connecting to the university and to the community and introducing citizenship on the level of care for each other. Um, so. If I have to kind of sum it up, because I think we're uh, at the end of this round, um, what I'd like to kind of see m much more conversation and tools to uh, be able to uh, set projects that consider benefit over profit. And projects that uh, the values are driving the value, not the other way round that it's just about the value, the, the single bottom line. And I think values is something that uh, when you write or negotiate the brief, it's really important to understand that that is uh, really part of the vision. Uh, getting the vision into the brief and not just the uh, sales targets um, means that you need to understand who it's for and what kind of um, And in that sense, the question is, what shapes your practice? shapes your, fo your practice. This was the previous slide before Kobe made it into something interesting. Um, and really the question for um, this conference in that sense is what purpose influences uh, your design practice or what purpose influences your design education? Thank you. <laughs>